sorry, sorry. Sorry. Uh, hello, welcome to this uh, morning session of Uppsala, our last morning. Uh, we have uh, the pleasure to have Atsushi Garashi speak as our keynote. Uh, Atsushi studied uh, computer science in Tokyo and he's now a professor in Kyoto. He spent a couple of years in Indiana and uh, in uh, Philadelphia. And many of us uh, know him for his work on Federway Java, on polymorphic types, gradual typing, and uh, many aspects of, of typing object-oriented systems. And I think today he will talk about something different. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. No, I'm not going to sing, <laughs> but I, I'll talk about ver verification today. And it's my great, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me as a keynote speaker. And um, right. So, so for those uh, who don't know me very well, uh, here is my uh, research line. I'm a big fan of types for RPL designs and verification. I have worked on uh, linear types and classes and objects, multi-stage programming and gradual typing. And now I'm more into uh, verification. Um, I'm so what. Well, Uppsala is one of the first big conferences where I presented a paper uh, when I was a graduate student. Um, so, the, yeah, Federal Java paper appeared in Uppsala and uh, other papers, some other papers. All right, uh, let me start uh, with this quote. Uh, things like even software verification. This has been the holy grail of computer science for many decades. Uh, holy, holy grail is, I think, is a metaphor uh, or something that is very hard to get. Okay. Um, does anybody know who said this? Yeah. Right. And when was it? Yeah, approximately. It's a long time ago. Okay, uh, so it goes like this, but now in some very key areas, for example, driver verification. So this means device drivers. Uh, we are building tools that can do actual proofs about the software and how it works in order to guarantee the reliability. So, so Bill Gates uh, made this remark in 2002, 20 years ago. So, so it sounds like the holy grail was within reach, okay? So we have seen SLAM, uh, Coverity Check, uh, or Infar, and several other, uh, even commercial uh, software verifier or analyzer. And we have uh, seen plenty of work about program verification. It was 20 years ago, but we are still developing new program verifiers every day. So. Uh, what's going on? It was the Holy Grail within reach? So that, that's that, uh, the topic I'm going to talk about. So the, here is the plan of my talk. Uh, I'm going to share some experiences and some visions in verification. Um, I'm going to use uh, examples from smart contracts and some of the IoT systems uh, which I started to work on uh, very recently. So. Uh, my, my main takeaways are as follows. Um, so it, it's kind of boring, straightforward, uh, but uh, at the application areas grow, uh, you, need, you face different kinds of cha challenges. Uh, you, you need for collaboration with domain experts, like uh, smart contract experts, who are not really experts of for verification, so there, there is a challenge. And um, the pace of growth is so fast, you need to keep, keep it up. And, and this is an exciting area of research, so join us today. All right, so um, I just, I'm going to start, I'm, I'm going to talk about 
smart control verification. So this is joint work with uh, Kohei. Um, oops. Yeah. Kohei, uh, who is a colleague of mine, and postdoc Yuki, and Jun Furuse. Uh, he is uh, he has a startup uh, about uh, blockchain uh, in Kyoto, and some other uh, ex students of mine. All right, let me get, give some uh, background about the uh, blockchain. I'm sure that everyone has heard of blockchains, but uh, some of you may not know uh, what it is. So blockchains are kind of just an implementation of a ledger which records uh, transactions or um, transfer of money between people. Okay, but it's uh, implemented as a distributed way. So copies of the ledger are uh, dis distributed over network. And there is a thing called consensus protocol to mediate racy operation transfers. So uh, th there are several kinds of operations, but uh, um, the most important one is uh, money transfer. Uh, it, so it records uh, from whom to whom, uh, how much money was transferred, and so on. Okay, and cryptography is used to prevent falsification. So you, <laughs> you shouldn't be able to mess up the ledger. Okay, and there is cryptocurrency to give incentive to maintain the whole system. So it is, it, the whole system is run by uh, people called miners or bakers, uh, depending on which system you are using. But um, assuming these things are working well, we can see, uh, we can view uh, this ledger as just a function from IDs, bunch of IDs of the users to the uh, current amount of money uh, that each uh, person has. Okay, so type, of ledger is just a function from ID to money. <laughs> okay. So smart contracts. So it's just a program to manipulate this distributed ledger. But the interesting thing uh, is that code, your code is recorded on the ledger and, and it's usually associated with a stateful account. Uh, so, so each account has um, the amount of money as its state, but in addition to it has a, a different state for, for programs. So then now the type of the ledger is extended to uh, something like, oh, oops, sorry, something like this. So it's, uh, now it's a function from ID to a pair of money, uh, which is necessary, and an optional uh, pair of code and state the latest state. And um, an operation to transfer money is often associated with an invocation of a smart contract. So when you send uh, money to another account and when it happens to be a smart contract account, then that program will, will be run and do something for you. But, uh, so in some sense, it's uh, just a program, but it's stateful. So uh, here, um, um, uh, an observation is that smart contracts are just persistent objects. So it, it, um, it has state and there, there is a method to manipulate the state and it, it stays on the, on the chain, all right? So, since uh, it, smart contracts are just programs, uh, it's a target for program verification. But uh, why do you bother uh, verifying smart contracts? Well, it's mm, somewhat obvious. So since con smart contracts manipulate some values, uh, bugs in contracts may cause significant economic loss. You may heard of the DAO attack in 2016, which caused an intended transfer of cryptocurrency, which is equivalent to 50 million US dollars, which is big. But uh, 
you may you may ask, are there any challenges in addition to ordinary program verification? As I said, it, it's just a computer program. Well, um, I have kind of two answers. Uh, first of all, um, how should so it? It's not clear how specifications should be given. I, I'm going to talk about it later. Uh, so, so, so the question is, what is unintended transfer? This is not very clear to me, at least. And another more technical challenge is that uh, issue is that uh, there are unknown contracts. So uh, as I said, um, contract execution um, do, will do something. And that's something um, includes uh, another money transfer. And this can involve the ex execution of unknown contracts. Okay. So it's really infeasible to verify all of these unknown contracts beforehand. So it, maybe it's compared to verification of higher order contracts. A uh, higher order control, a uh, higher order function. Higher order functions takes a function, uh, unknown function as a parameter and invokes it. But in, when, when we uh, verify higher order contracts, we, we can make some assumptions on the parameter it takes, but it, it's not realistic in this world. Okay. So uh, actually, we are working on a kind of uh, exotic, strange uh, blockchain called Tezos, uh, not Ethereum. Uh, the, the currency is called XTZ. And uh, so it's, its consensus protocol is based on something called liquid proof of stake, and, um, but you, you can forget it uh, during this talk. And the protocol, uh, and one, one interesting aspect is that uh, the protocol defines how the protocol itself should evolve. As, as part of it, the protocol description. So the entire system is never stable. Every three months, uh, there is an upgrade and uh, everyone gets kind of nervous uh, whether uh, update is going to going well. And uh, you can forget about these two things. But uh, so one of the things I like about Tezos is it's designed with formal verification in mind. Uh, what I mean by this is that for example, the protocol core is implemented in OCaml, which is a type safe language and memory safe language. And it has, it provides a smart contract language called Michelson. And the Michelson virtual machine is implemented by using GLTs. So in some sense, type safety proof is implemented as a part of the virtual machine, which is great. So uh, I'll talk about the uh, Michelson language a little bit. Uh, from now. So Michelson language. It's apparently named after Albert Michelson, which is a great uh, physicist uh, who tried but failed to show the existence of the lumin luminif <laughs> luminiferous ether. Uh, I think it's a pan of Ethereum. I don't know. So it's a strange language. Uh, it's functional but stack-based language with block structure. Which is which is kind of strange, but the, so you can push uh, two ints and add and make a conditional branch on on the on three, and uh, since it's it has block structure, there's no jump instruction, and it, if is it comes with uh, two blocks of then branch and else branch. Okay, it has a simple static type system. So at each program point, the length of the operand stack and the type of each stack element are statically determined. And uh, there is no heap. So you can put a list of, say, uh, say one, one, 100 elements as a single element on the stack. So, and functions are uh, first class values. And there are a rich set of primitive data types, such as lists, big nouns, maps. They, they are all primitives. And there is even uh, higher order instructions like map over list or maps. So it basically are uh, functional language in a disguised form. All right. 
So, and my, Microsoft, oh, of course, uh, provides some uh, features for writing smart contracts. But, um, so first of all, blockchain operations such as money transfers are treated as first class values. There's no instruction to invoke another contract. Okay, so you, when, when you program a smart contract, you have to uh, create an object that represents the operations to perform next and, uh, and push onto the stack. And so, so now, now you may wonder what, what, what can I do? So contract has to be written uh, as a purely functional program, not as an uh, effective program. So the type of code uh, is like this. It takes a pair of the initial, the current state and a parameter as a pair, and it returns the updated state and the uh, list of operations, which represents uh, what to do next. Okay. So of course, the type of the state and parameter varies from uh, one account to another, uh, but, um, and, um, so, so due to, as you can see, there's not really return values in the standard sense. You cannot return any value to the cola. So, and this operation list works as a kind of continuation, okay? So it's kind of close to Trump line uh, style. And I each, account is associated with only one code, but you can implement kind of multiple method or entry points uh, by using some types. So if you want to um, implement two methods uh, that takes uh, A as a parameter and another uh, that takes B as a parameter by using this uh, type of equation, uh, which takes uh, some of A, A and B. Okay, and right. Ah, by the way, um, so since the, this is a stack-based language, there are of course uh, many high-level uh, languages that compile to Microsoft. They are proposed. And okay, and let's see uh, how a contract invocation is processed by a simple example. So this is a the whole state of the blockchain. So it has several accounts and each is, has a balance. Alice has 10 TZ and her state is 42 as an integer, but Bob uh, has a string state and each has a contract P1, P2 and so on. And uh, so Alice sends five TZ to Bob with an argument seven. What happens is that uh, the smart contract associated to Bob will be executed. And suppose P2 returns bar, a uh, string, and a list of two operations, transfer to Xena, uh, to Xena 3TZ, and uh, transfer to Alice 1TZ. Then uh, what happens is that, uh, first of all, uh, the state of Bob is updated to bar, which was returned by P2. And then I, the blockchain system runs uh, these two operations in, in this order. And uh, it repeats until, uh, so, so then, then uh, Zena's, uh, account, I'm sorry, contract will be run and Alice's contract will be run. And then it repeats uh, until no operations are returned. Okay, then uh, commit, uh, they, they try to commit all the changes to the blockchain as one transaction. It's an atomic uh, transaction. Or uh, if the, one of the uh, contract execution fails, then uh, it aborts and revert back to the original state. Okay, so that's how uh, Tezos smart contract work. And we are uh, building a verifier for Microsoft contracts named Helmholtz. 
So it's named after Hermann von Helmholtz, who turns out to be Michelson's thesis advisor. Okay, so Helmholtz watching the behavior of Michelson. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay, so it's based on uh, refinement types, and uh, it takes as an input Michelson code and, and it, uh, with, with uh, its spec. Uh, spec consists of precondition on the input parameter and the initial state, post conditions are on the final state and the resulting operation list. And uh, currently, um, one has to, someone has to uh, give uh, loop invariance and pre and post conditions for uh, fast graph functions. But we, we may use uh, other techniques to uh, infer uh, loop invariance and uh, the spec for fast graph functions. And it outputs whether the code satisfied the pre and post conditions by saying yes or no, or maybe time out. So let me show a simple and somewhat silly example. Uh, it's called a boomerang. Uh, what it does is when it receives XTZ, it transfers XTZ back to uh, the one initiated the transaction. So it's the, the money you send uh, comes back to you. So, so that's why it's called boomerang. And um, I'm not, you don't have to understand the uh, original code and the important one is the spec, I think. So let's zoom in. So um, precondition is true. So there is no restriction about uh, the input. And post condition is somewhat uh, complicated. Um, before going into the detail, let me point out there are some special variables like amount, uh, ops, or source. So amount stands for the, um, the sent amount of money. And ops stands for the output uh, operation list. And source stands for uh, who sent this money, roughly speaking. So this post condition means that if amount was zero, uh, then um, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't do anything. So operation this should be empty. Okay, if amount is more than zero, then it has to uh, issue an operation to transfer money back, okay? So it says, well, I, I, I won't uh, explain the, um, all the details, but the important thing is that ops should be a single uh, singleton list, consists of um, transfer object of uh, whose destination is, is C, which comes from the source account. And the, uh, the amount to be sent is the same as the uh, amount uh, it received. Okay, so that's kind of usual um, spec. And uh, you, you can experiment. Uh, we have uh, a web server for, for, for your fun. So uh, theory behind Helmholtz is uh, kind of a tweaked version of refinement types. So we have, uh, so refinement types adapted for higher order stack based language. <laughs> So the, the status of a uh, stack is described by something called refinement stack types. It's, it's, uh, it takes this form. So it means that uh, the stack consists of n values named x1 up to xn, uh, whose types, simple types are t1 through tn. And uh, these elements should satisfy uh, the predicate phi. So for example, stack consists of two elements, three and two, uh, can be given ty this type. So it consists of two elements, x1 and x2, and the top element should be uh, greater than the second element. And the type judgment takes this form. Uh, gamma describes, uh, gamma declares uh, specif specification variables. And you can, you can mention these uh, variables from uh, the precondition and post condition, which are uh, capital phi one and phi two, and p is a code. Okay, so it means it, it's just like whole logic. Um, when you start the execution, uh, 
of the of P, um, where the stack satisfies phi one, and when it um, terminates, the final stack should satisfy phi two. That's the meaning. So, for example, um, sub. Uh, this is the instruction for subtraction. So it can uh, it can be given this type or or maybe another type. So the uh, if the first element is greater than the second, the resulting stack will be a single singleton stack, which is positive. Or um, so the um, boomerang TZ uh, can be typed like this. So true and false conditions are, are borrowed from the last slide. And uh, I will show some typing rules, uh, but uh, it's pretty much like uh, proof rules for whole logic. So if you are familiar with them, with it, uh, it's nothing surprising. But uh, the first one is uh, the typing rule for CKSL composition. Uh, if P1 kind of translates the stack of, of type phi1 to phi2, and P2 converts, transfers the stack of type phi2 then to phi3, then uh, P1 semicolon P2 uh, transfers uh, the stack of type phi1 to phi3, which is obvious. And for if uh, that test uh, whether the top element is uh, zero or not, and then take one of the branches. So the initial stack should consist of n plus one element, and the top element should be int. And uh, then each branch, um, at, the, at the beginning of each branch, the stack will consist of n elements, because the top element will be consumed by the instruction. And uh, each branch is uh, has an additional constraint, which says x, uh, which can be mentioned in phi1, uh, is non-zero or zero, so something like this. OK, so, so they, they're kind of um, ordinary refinement types adapted for uh, stack-based language. And uh, this is how Helmholtz in, is implemented. It's also not surprising. So we, we feed uh, gamma, phi1, precondition, program, and postcondition. And then Helmholtz checks if uh, this type of judgment is der derivable by computing uh, the strongest postcondition of P uh, from phi1. Uh, it's called phi2. Then it asks an SMT solver uh, to discharge the verification condition whether phi two prime is, implies phi phi two uh, so phi two prime implies phi two by asking uh, this is so satisfiable. All right, so so it's kind of usual uh, verification. Uh, those who are familiar uh, with formal verification, it's kind of boring. So let me summarize uh, the what I talked about so far. Um, so verification of purely functional smart contract language is not too hard, which is not surprising. But we still had to do a few rounds of trial and error to get uh, to the right design of the type system. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I, I didn't talk about that much. But building a verifier from scratch is rather time consuming. So we. We could translate uh, Microsoft programs into some functional program and verif use verifier for that language, but but um, we we didn't want uh, to um, write uh, the front end from scratch, so we borrowed uh, the code uh, from the VM. But the VM is so tightly integrated into the uh, blockchain system. Um, so yeah, similar that when we had a hard, hard time, it was rather time consuming, more con time consuming than we had expected initially. And um, the second one is more uh, kind of serious and important uh, one. In reality, useful applications are built by combining multiple smart contracts. Uh, as 
Currently, Helmholtz can uh, verify a single contract, but that's enough. Um, because the spec of a single contract doesn't tell a whole story of the whole lifetime of the uh, transaction. So the question is, what does a return op operation list really do? That, that's a question. So uh, from now, I'm going to talk about verifying multiple contracts. And this is pretty much work in progress. So the case study um, is uh, something called Dexter system, which stands, stands for decentralized exchange um, system. So it is simplified, but it implements kind of automated exchange between TXTZ and other tokens. Tokens are another non-native uh, cryptocurrency implemented on top of a blockchain system. So um, yeah, so there are two contracts, smart contracts that implement the exchange service. So first entity is uh, something called FA 1.2. Uh, FA stands for financial application. Uh, if you know Ethereum, uh, there is a ERC20 uh, specification that, that specifies how a token should be implemented. So it, so it implements uh, another currency and it maintains uh, the balance for each token holder uh, aside, from, um, aside from the, the original ledger. And um, so this is a kind of public service um, uh, providing another currency. Okay, uh, the second entity is called Constant Product Market Maker. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, it's called CPMM, uh, which does the job of exchange. So uh, people ask uh, asks uh, CPMM. Am I able to exchange their token to XTZ or buy tokens uh, by paying XTZ to CPMM? But from the FA one point uh, viewpoint, CPMM is just a client of the service of uh, the token. Okay, so the first we have FA one point two, and then uh, several people uh, build uh, CPMM like exchange service. Okay, then uh, let me uh, talk about FA 1.2. Uh, it's a standardized API to implement tokens. So it has to maintain two tables. So obviously one of the table is balances, uh, which records who owns how much, how many tokens. Okay, uh, there is um, another table, which called allowances. So it's interesting. So it records uh, who allows whom to uh, move how much tokens from X to anyone. So it, it so um, X wants to, it's kind of giving uh, tokens from X to Y, but uh, um, so it gives Y a right to uh, withdraw money, something like that. Okay, so it has to implement two methods. Uh, one is transfer tokens. Uh, the meaning should be obvious to you. It takes uh, two, uh, three arguments. X and Y are uh, the name of accounts, and it moves n tokens from X to Y. And if uh, one of the following uh, conditions are satisfied, uh, one case is X is the sender. If um, the send, sender, uh, the who initiated the transaction is equal to X, then uh, yeah, it's kind of authentication, right? Then, then uh, N tokens will be moved to Y by updating the table of balances. Or um, X might be allowed to transfer any tokens from Y. In, in that case, uh, token movement will uh, happen. And the other method is approve. It changes the state of allowances. Okay, so it takes two arguments, X and N, and sets allowance. The sender uh, allows X, another person, to withdraw N token that sender owns. Uh, it, it takes some time to digest. 
Okay, then then it's a it's kind of public service. Anyone can use it when when it's implemented. Then CPMM, which has a token pool, um, which is the which represents um, his token balance. It should be it should correspond to the balance recorded in FA 1.2, but it CPMM has its own record of how much money, how much tokens uh, he has. And it has to provide one method. Or may, maybe there, there are some others, but I, I will uh, focus on one method, uh, which is called token to XTZ. It takes three accounts, X, Y, and N, uh, which is to sell N tokens owned by X and uh, by converting um, and, and convert uh, to XTZ and sends the equivalent uh, XTZ to Y. So Y is the destination. And it has to do the following things. Uh, first of all, it has to um, compute the value in tokens by, by using the current rate of exchange. So let's say it's MTZ. Then it has to create the following transfer operations. One is that uh, it issues a transfer uh, to it invokes uh, sorry uh, this should be F FA 1.2 I'm sorry and um, it should invoke uh, transfer to transfer tokens on FA 1.2 by these arguments X is the given by the uh, initiator and CPM so it asks um, to transfer transfer N tokens from X to CPMA, okay? So X is going to sell N tokens, okay? And uh, transfer, uh, this should be M, I'm sorry, M MTG to Y, okay? Then they increment uh, his uh, own state. So let's see how it works. Suppose Alice would like to buy a pizza from Bob uh, the pizza costs 50 TZ, but she doesn't have enough XTZ right now, and so decides to sell her tokens uh, through Dexter. Okay, that's a scenario. And so, uh, right now, um, <laughs> CPMM, uh, so, so this is FA 1.2, uh, it records table balances. Alice has 10 tokens, CPMM, CPMM has 2,000 tokens, and uh, CPM knows his, his own balance, okay? The first thing Aris has to do, uh, so since Aris wants, uh, wants CPM MM to work uh, for her, CPM is uh, her proxy. So first thing he ha she has to do is to uh, approve set allowance uh, by um, to to for for CPMM to transfer uh, ten tokens, so it changes uh, the table allowances uh, like this. Okay, then uh, she issues uh, she asks CPMM to exchange her token and sends the the exchanged uh, money to Bob. All right. And then CPMM does uh, what it's supposed to do. So um, CPMM MM, uh, issues a transfer tokens operation uh, by saying, uh, please uh, transfer Alice's 10 token to my account and transfer uh, 50 TZ, uh, which is equivalent to 10 tokens to Bob. Then having received the uh, the money for a pizza, uh, Bob will deliver a pizza to Alice. Off chain, of course. Pizza is not digital. All right, so what can go wrong? Actually, the, there are uh, two flaws uh, pointed by um, people at Nomadic Labs. So uh, first one is, depending on how, how allowance is set, RC's tokens may be stolen. I don't think it's a really a bug of Dexter, 
but but um, it was pointed out. And the the second one is more interesting. Anyone can steal XTG from CPMM, but the secret is is uh, I, I didn't tell the the hint to the second one. So so um, so you you will not be able to uh, guess what it is. But the floor number one, depending on how allowance is set, uh, Alice's talk may be stolen. So after the first action of Alice, a world famous cat may issue this uh, operation, token to XTG from Alice to cat uh, 10. So then uh, CPMM just believes this operation and asks uh, to transfer um, Alice's token to me and transfers the 50 TZ to the cat. This is weird. Well, uh, as if you are familiar with concurrent programming, uh, the allowance, the setting allowance and uh, transfer should be done in an at atomic way. Okay, so, so steps one and two A should have been done atomically, but it's not easy to uh, issue uh, more than one operation atomically in, in Tezos, so people uh, have, people thought uh, this was a bug. The other point uh, you may notice is that step 2A should authenticate because a cat asks uh, to transfer uh, Alice's token, which is strange. And another question you might have is, why is it allowed to specify X in the token to XTZ uh, method? Because the problem seems to occur from the fact that X is different from the sender. OK, that, that's the first uh, anomaly. Float number two, anyone can steal XTZ from CPMM. Um, without Alice, the cat, uh, Cheshire, um, issues this operation. Please uh, give the money for 10 tokens of CPML and send to me. Interesting. So CPML just believes uh, this request and uh, issues two transfers. Um, one is transfer tokens from CPML to CPML and transfer uh, the uh, transfer 50 TZ to the cat. Okay, interestingly enough, according to the specification, sales transfer must succeed. As a result of sales transfer, uh, for the FA 1.2, nothing happens. It's sales transfer. But uh, CPMM um, had sent 50 TZ to the cat. So, so you can steal any uh, money from CPMM. So this is strange. So that uh, there are nomadic labs people proposed a uh, fix to these problems uh, by deleting the first parameter from talk to, talking to XTZ because the, the source of the problems uh, seems to be the fact that um, one can specify any account name as the first parameter of uh, token to XTZ. Okay, and then CPMM should call uh, transfer tokens uh, by setting the sender as the first argument. Then, okay, then it seems that these two flaws will go away. Okay, so let me give some thoughts about this. So both CPMM and FA 1.2 do what they are supposed to do. So it's kind of according, uh, it, it obeys the specification. Their correctness as an independent contract can be verified easily by using Helmholtz. But in what sense is the proposed fix a fix? It's not very clear. Uh, it may be because only the FA 1.2 balance of the sender decreases. By, by fixing the, the, the system? Or is it because the invariant that token pool is uh, not greater than 
if we 1.2 balance of CPMM? I don't know. And um, so they, they decided to delete the first parameter, but I can imagine there may be a reason for transfer tokens to have the first argument. For example, Alice may want to ask Bob to exchange the token for her. So I, I, I would like to pay uh, for pizza by um, tokens, but can you please do, do that for me? But such allowance should be recorded on the on chain and should be checked, but it is not not on chain. So so there is no way to uh, check such allowance is uh, beforehand. So, uh, but it it's really um, non-trivial to specify this uh, spec. So we want some specification or contract language and verification technology for resource or asset management, including the notion of resources, assets, uh, who, who owns what, and the rights to move resources, and the, these rights can be regarded as resources. So there, there is an interesting work presented at last loops by Brahman and others, and move language by meta uh, may be relevant. So, so I, we are interested in this work. So, but, but, but aside from that, uh, we try to verify uh, the, uh, the invariant of the system uh, by using Helmholtz. The, the, well, one of the uh, reasonable invariant is, the, is that uh, token pool uh, which is a record. Uh, so the token pool represents the belief uh, of CPMM. Uh, I, I should have this amount of tokens in, in FA 1.2. And um, if token pool is greater than uh, FA 1.0, real balance recorded in FA 1.2, that, that, that's strange. So this uh, invariant should hold. And CPMM's allowance is, should be always zero. And um, okay, I, I will skip the details, but uh, we managed to uh, verify this invariant by combining Helmholtz and uh, actually we, we are using Y3 uh, verifier. So the idea is to encode the whole, um, whole lifetime of a transaction um, by Y3 program and uh, give it to the uh, verifier. Okay, uh, I'll skip this. Okay, so so to summarize this part, um, smart contract to verification for Tezos. So, so standard verification techniques work to some degree. So, <laughs> of course, and, um, and Interesting thing is that it's impossible to verify the whole world. So I, I skipped uh, this interesting part, but the existing or unknown no verified code in, is unavoidable. And there is one Tezos specific issue. Um, since contract invocations are expressed by lists, you have to analyze the list elements very precisely. Otherwise you don't know what will happen uh, after the, uh, the contract a single contract execution. And uh, final, financial correctness is not always uh, equal to functional correctness, uh, which we usually care. So an interesting question is what should the high level contract language and specification like language should look like? And, um, and we should um, be able to make verify fires uh, easy to build. So gen general purpose SMT solvers are great, especially when they work. And, and um, so there is SMT lib format as a common interface to various SMT solvers, which makes, easy to, makes it easy to switch from one solver to another. But we want a more convenient interface as a backend of verifiers for high level languages. We may need support for spotting the location of verification errors. Uh, it's, it's kind of nightmare right now. And support for explaining counterexamples. Yes, SMT solvers can generate a counterexample in terms of the uh, 
uh, low level uh, formula. But uh, we want to give feedback uh, where it went wrong in terms of the high level language. Or we want even a framework to build verifiers for different PLs. Uh, with, for compilers, we are close, right? All right, that's it for the uh, smart contract part. Uh, let me go through quickly uh, another project. Uh, it's called, called Zero Trust IoT, uh, which is a recent project I'm uh, getting involved. So motivation is to secure IoT systems. Um, you may have heard of Zero Trust architecture, which is a buzzword. IoT is a buzzword. Why not combine them? So the slogan of uh, Zero Trust is never trust, always verify. OK, so, so that kind of thing. So applying this principle to enterprise systems has been investigated. Uh, for example, Google de is developing beyond code. But IoT systems are much more vulnerable. Um, however, for example, um, impersonation or device, even device can be replaced by malicious people. So, th so the goal here is to build uh, IoT si secure IoT systems following zero trust principle by using formal verification on the system software technologies. And uh, we have four research groups uh, in this project. And my group and Parol's group are uh, focusing on formal verification of IoT protocols and trust change, chains um, of IoT systems. And we, uh, we are aiming at combining uh, static and dynamic verification techniques. And the other groups are experts of systems and uh, security. So this is, should be an interesting exciting collaboration uh, with those people. Our view on Zero Trust is like DevSecOps, yet another buzzword. Uh, so the, the DevSecOps recommends this kind of cycle of development to build a secure system. So you start uh, anywhere from coding, then you build, and you have to test before deployment. But even after releasing the product, you have to watch the behavior of the product and then feedback to the next version. It's kind of usual. But uh, we want to enhance the testing part by forward verification. Um, and monitoring should be, shouldn't be ad hoc. It should be specified uh, in a logical manner. So uh, this is the kind of combination of static and dynamic uh, type checking or verification. So maybe gradual typing for IoT, uh, we may want to study. So in fact, formal, formal verification of IoT system isn't very new, but it's still challenging. So uh, the last of the, my talk, uh, I want to share my story about our collaboration with uh, our people in the system uh, background. So we worked on investigating a published paper on formal verification of the secure boot sequence in the uh, something called ARM trusted firmware. Um, and the paper claimed uh, that this firmware a protocol has a flaw. We, we used uh, the Tamarin prover to find a counter example. But uh, as we investigate the paper, Formal models are not, it's really difficult to understand. The system experts had a very hard time. And I also had a hard time to understand the rewriting uh, system. And so the Tamarin prover is based on multi-set rewriting and code is not very uh, readable. So it turns out that claimed counter example needs one device to be turned on more than once, which is impossible uh, before turning off. OK, so the, we concluded that the formal model, model is not faithful. So uh, we uh, so after finding out that we, we are kind of like, <sighs> and the voice from heaven says, never trust, always verify. I hate it when I find it, uh, it applies to 
published scientific papers. <laughs> okay, so uh, our challenge is here is that uh, verification tools should be usable by even IoT system experts. <laughs> no offense here, because they, they are not familiar with verification techniques. I'm serious. And um, another challenge is that to develop techniques to remedy formal proofs and running systems when security assumptions turn out to be broken. All right, uh, I'll wrap up my talk. We are hiring a postdoc um, in Kyoto. Uh, if you are interested in this project, IoT project, uh, please talk to me. Then, our final few words, uh, we have been making steady progress in formal verification. <laughs> And uh, but new application areas emerge every day, and they should need some form of verification. FinTech, like smart contracts, IoT, maybe AI. AI is a hot topic. And uh, but we have to uh, carefully investigate what is correctness there. <laughs> and to catch the speed of growth is so fast, we need to catch up, and we need technology to build new verifiers quickly and we have to collaborate with domain experts. Okay, uh, this is the last slide of mine. I'll take questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, so uh, you initially mentioned that there are also higher order functions and uh, uh, along with the states. So did you find some challenges? Like what are the challenges which are different than let's say what F-Star does or any other uh, such uh, systems does with allows both uh, states and higher order functions? Can you comment so, on that? Um, states are not really a problem because um, the program itself is purely functional. So it takes a function, but there's no side effect. So, and, uh, and state can be trusted. The only way to manipulate state is to invoke a uh, method, which can be verified. Okay, but, but the, um, when a contract returns, uh, operation that transfers money to an unknown contract, then it will do some, something evil. So, so that, that's a challenging part. So the idea is to replace such an unknown call with uh, uh, a list of non-deterministic uh, calls to myself. So they, uh, um, they can do anything but the only thing they can do to me is to invoke some, some of my methods. So, so how, that's how the challenge, I, am, I, am, I in, am I, do I understand your question? Okay. Like a net question. So you uh, mentioned about the uh, boomerang uh, smart contract where the sender sends the um, same amount back to the receiver, right? And then the receiver will send it back to the sender. So like eventually, like there'll, no, uh, there'll not be any termination, right? Uh, because this will keep on going on. Yeah. This. So, so, right, right. Um, it, it doesn't go forever because there's a notion of gas. Uh, so, so you have to pay um, that the initiator of the transaction has to pay some, some money to run a small contract. If uh, that gas runs out, the, the entire transaction will be over. And so, so there, there's some limit of the application. We, we don't take this into account, but we, uh, and um, for, to, for verifier, um, so as I said uh, in the answer to the last question, uh, so the non-deterministic list of uh, operations can be empty. So that uh, stands for the end of the uh, transaction. Okay, there's a question here. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you again for the nice talk. Um, I was wondering, so you mentioned in this verification of the contracts, uh, you said that uh, in the output you have these uh, lists of, uh, of instructions to invoke some sort of a continuation. So why is analyzing that any different from interprocedural analysis that we kind of yeah. sort of know how to do, right? Yeah, it's, it's nonsense. Yeah, yeah. But the... Um, I mean, it, it should be it should be somewhat easier because you're not returning. It's like a like a go to with parameters. So I'm I'm wondering somewhat what what is the difference? Why it poses verification problems? Uh, one of the problem is that um, uh, the we don't know uh, which contract will be executed, and the other is that since uh, everything is put into one list. Um, a uh, simple uh, verification um, is kind of fooled uh, easily uh, and can't make any conclusion about the length of the list because uh, if, if, it, uh, if it may produce a list of lengths one or two, depending on some condition, um, you need to very carefully uh, analyze the contents of this and its length. So, so we, we had to have another static analyzer specialized for the output of this. There is one last question up there. Uh, Uh, hi, thanks for your talk. So um, you mentioned that we need better frameworks for building verifiers. So I'm no expert, but as far as I understand, there do exist some of these frameworks like Viper and, and I think others. So can you say what you think is missing in those frameworks? What is, why are, why are, why are those not yet good enough for you? Or? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, yeah, I should, I, I, I know Viper. Yes, yes. No, thank you for that. Um, I, I need to, um, yeah, I don't have an answer right now. Well, um, let's thank Atsushi. <laughs> so, bef before you go, because of the last plenary thing, uh, just a couple of quick thank yous. Um, Atsushi already got the present. It was preempted, the keynote. <laughs> Jan and Amal, just want to thank you for organizing the Uppsala PC because they're the two PC chairs that were doing all the work for the papers that are still happening. So let's thank them with a little something. And Amal, thank you. And uh, there is a couple of other people who were running the conference. It will actually continue today. It doesn't finish now. There is stops until 5.30 in case you're tempted by Saturday, which is, by the way, in US Friday, which means that if you leave tonight, you'll arrive today morning. So, you know, you don't need to worry about missing the weekend. Um, and uh, we have a few organizers. Zhishang is the most important person for all of this. Can we come up here, please? We have something for you. It's actually different from the other bags, so it's extra special. He is the one who is running videos. The air meet, and every time anything goes wrong, people on Discord go, Zhishang, 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 Zhishang. So he is surprisingly awake after five and a half days. And uh, this is what happens for everyone who is virtual and who is not here and all the recordings. This is Zhishang who's been doing it. So please, please, please acknowledge him. This is the hardest job. And then we have... Um, yeah, we have virtualization chairs who made it happen, which is View You. She's been running around quietly. I just need to remember which one is where. She's the one who is making sure that it actually happens for people. This is the technical person, and this is the actual virtualization overview person, if that makes sense. So this is why we're having it. There is a couple people left, student volunteers. Julian. This is the person who runs the 30 student volunteers, believe it or not. 
at all times. So I'll give you something as well. And uh, finally, we have one, two, three, four. That's right. Um, where is Andrea? She said she's coming. Oh, yes, there we are. The person who actually made all of the updates on the website at all times and the schedule. Anytime you had a problem with the schedule, oh, I want to reschedule or move this talk and things like that. That was Andrea at the last minute and changing the papers. The author saying, oh, actually, I feel like presenting now. Oh, I feel like presenting tomorrow. No, 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 no now is good. So this is Andrea who was fixing this for the last six days. So thank you very, very much. And uh, finally, we have the venue organizer. I don't know if you realized Iwona was behind the scenes. She works here at the University of Auckland, the venue organizer for the Auckland. I wonder if you come over here. We have something extra special for you. <laughs> and she's the one who organized the baggage storage, which we have, because she said, your auntie Dean will ask for this. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it happened. <laughs> So everything that has been happening, all the rooms, all the fixes behind the scenes, all the food, caterers, etc., that was her. So thank you, Avona. And then finally, last but not least, the person who was buying all the presents <laughs> and, <laughs> and organizing pretty much the entire conferences and everything on Sigland is Niringa. And this is something for you. She is, as you know, you will see her around at Popol and you will see her around at ICFP. And this is what makes sick plan conferences work. So there you go. I already got my presents, so don't worry. <laughs> so that's all good. Thank you very much. And ice cream special at 3 o'clock. Remember, ice cream special. And let's just take a minute to thank Alex. <laughs> let's... We're not doing it with gifts, but you've been absolutely amazing and on top of everything. Super high energy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.